My name is Mark Lusk, and I'm a professor of social work at the University of Texas at El Paso. And for the past five years, we've had a uh, grant with the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health to engage in teaching clinical skills in Spanish and also to teach cultural competency in social work and health sciences. Uh, there are several elements of this project that we'd like to tell you about, um, but the purposes of the module in general are to tell you a little bit about the Hogg Foundation, to give you a sense of uh, what it is that we do in the classes and in the whole comprehensive program to train uh, social workers uh, for clinical practice in mental health settings that are culturally competent and linguistically competent, and also to show you some of the skill-based techniques that we use by demonstrating in three interviews, one in Spanish and two in English, how we go about this in the classroom. So uh, this module is broken up into several segments and you can go backward and forward in the module at your computer station or on the DVD in class, however you are using this. Uh, just feel free to uh, use it as you see fit. Everything that we have here is in the public domain, uh, so you may share this with anyone. Uh, the Hogg Foundation was established in, in 1940 um, as an effort by a family in Texas to begin to address some of the issues in Texas that, that we are known for, which is a shortage of mental health workers, and uh, for uh, providing services to youth uh, in the state of Texas, um, vulnerable youth and especially youth and adults with mental uh, health issues. Uh, the Hogg Foundation has awarded millions of dollars and all 13 schools of social work uh, in the state of Texas presently have at least one contract with the Hogg Foundation. Um, much of that is around the issue of uh, developing students for mental health practice uh, who are also culturally competent. That's how we got in on this on the ground floor, uh, but we were selected by the Hogg Foundation to do something a little bit more comprehensive insofar as in addition to just awarding scholarships, we were also providing our students with group mentoring. Uh, we were also developed a class called Intervención, Evaluación e Intervención en Español, which is a class called uh, Assessment and Intervention in Spanish, and several other components. So those of you who are watching who are interested in securing Hogg Foundation funds, they involved in enhancing services, developing the mental health workforce, and improving social po public policy, supporting research and promoting education, and just go to the Hogg Foundation website to see how you and your school of social work or counseling program or psychology program can access those kinds of resources. And if you're not from the state of Texas and you're accessing this, there ho we hope that there's a lot of ideas in this module that may be useful for you because these are not problems or issues by any means restricted to the state of Texas or the borderland where we live and work. Um, the UTEP project has several key components, not just the class that I mentioned, which is teaching uh, intervention and assessment in Spanish, in the Spanish language, uh, but, but it also has um, the element of focusing on our region and understanding that the border region affects everything about being a social, work, uh, social worker in this environment. In fact, the MSW at UTEP is called, uh, or has as its concentration, social work in the border region. But we don't just describe the border region as the technical term would define it as the 200 miles on either side of the border um, that constitutes a legal definition of the border region. We define the border region as a metaphor for the differences and, and walls that are separating different people based on their national origin, their culture, their axes of privilege, where they stand in the system. And so we believe that in many respects, the U.S.-Mexico is not only a metaphor, but it's everywhere. And that's because the Mexican diaspora, if you will, from Mexico into the United States, which has been a very positive thing for this country, in my point of view, has been to all corners of the United States. So the issues that we're going to talk about as clinicians are going to be relevant to you whether you work in Omaha, Nebraska, Napa, Idaho, the San Fernando Valley of California, upstate New York, uh, where all kinds of uh, workforces are staffed by Mexican migrants and also long-standing residents of the United States and citizens of the United States of Mexican origin. 
Uh, we believe that the best way to understand the border context is to understand it as a peripheral region within the United States. If you think of the United States as a highly advanced and industrial nation, we, we, we recognize that there are certain pockets of uh, people and geography that are very much dispossessed and, and pushed out of the mainstream and they're the periferia, as we say in Spanish, at the periphery. And some of those regions are Appalachia, uh, the region from Pennsylvania down to Georgia, the Four Corners, which is the corners where Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona come together, which is a very uh, deeply deprived area, primarily uh, of mineral extraction um, and populated primarily by indigenous people of the United States. Then the Black Belt, which is the uh, soils, uh, uh, deep soils uh, of agricultural richness that run from northern Georgia all the way over to, to Nacogdoches, Texas, and is primarily an African-American region of the United States, which is agricultural. Um, so the, in many respects, the border is uh, every, everywhere. But technically speaking, the border is, as you see on the PowerPoint, um, uh, the, the region right along the U.S.-Mexico border, and this is characterized by high poverty rates of 33 to 34, 38 percent, high unemployment rates, a lot of access issues around health care and mental health care. That's very critical to the Hogg Foundation, is enhancing access to health care and, and to mental health care. It's a majority Hispanic uh, part of the country by far. In fact, our city here, the University of Texas at El Paso, is about 78 percent Hispanic and uh, an area that has a lot of uh, housing injustice in the form of colonias, which are semi-rural or peri-urban centers that are in formal communities occupied by people who come in um, for lack of access to conventional housing. Uh, we also look at the U.S. border as right now, and I think has been for uh, decades and will continue to be for decades, a political issue um, and political economy shapes the way we frame all of our clinical issues because we don't believe that clinical social work is just a matter of dealing with one person one at a time or in a group, but rather also getting outside of the clinic and outside of the school and outside of the hospital into the community where we find that there's systematic oppression and systematic injustice. And I would say that the perspective of our MSW program very much reinforces the idea that there are large segments of the American population, people of color, migrants, immigrants, and more recently refugees, who are uh, put at an enormous disadvantage by framing the border region as a national security issue rather than a human security issue. And by that I mean this is perceived in the minds of folks outside of our region as a dangerous part of the country, when in fact it's not. The safest four cities in the United States are within 200 miles to 300 miles of the U.S. border, and the safest large city in the United States actually is El Paso, Texas. A lot of people don't know that because there's this driving narrative in American society that immigrants are a threat. There's this driving narrative in, in the American media that um, the drug war permeates Mexico, has destroyed Mexico, and that that drug war and the associated organized crime are uh, have, having an incursion into American society. And the only way to respond to that is with a military uh, national security uh, response. The approach of social work is contrary to that. It doesn't mean that those things are inappropriate completely, but that we do, after all, need law and order. But we do believe that this is a human security crisis. And when we see in our clinics, day after day, and in the sessions that we do in, as practitioners of social work in the community with refugees, we see highly traumatized people that are traumatized as a result of systematic injustice in Central America, Mexico, and the United States. So that's part of the uh, issue that is at the backdrop of this. A social worker just doesn't deal with a person on a one-on-one -on -one basis and then just be culturally competent, we have to understand that the larger structure within which that client functions is systematically distorted in a way that's going to provide them with nothing but injustice and provide them with one insult after another in the form of a trauma. Our region, and this is true for other regions of the United States that serve Hispanic clients, there's a shortage of mental health professionals and nurses, such social workers, psychologists, counselors, and physicians. In areas that are uh, in which large populations of Hispanic clients, not just Mexican American, but Hispanics of all uh, origins, because Hispanic is a very large term incorporating many, many uh, diverse groups, 
um, often reside within mental health shortage areas. And certainly the border region uh, and all of the camps for migrants and all of the major cities where we have high rates of unemployment and, uh, and, 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 and migrants moving through are typically mental health professional shortage areas. So we like to bring to uh, our, our, our students and to our colleagues and to our viewers on this module a perspective that the role of social work is not law enforcement, but it's human security, and that we offer a sanctuary and a, and a zone of safety and therapeutic respite for people who have uh, come to the United States, sometimes through adverse circumstances. Also, looking at the distribution of the Hispanic population in the United States, and this includes all Hispanics, uh, Dominican, uh, Afro-Caribbean, South American, Central American, Colombian, uh, Mexican, Puerto Rican, and so on. You see naturally, of course, as would be expected, that the largest distributions are on the West Coast through California, which is a, a majority minority state, meaning that there are more minorities in the state than there are um, uh, white of non-Hispanic origin, all through Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, and then more densely Anglo or Anglo-European uh, in the center with Florida and up the coast uh, being also highly represented in Hispanic. So this is by no means a purely border uh, issue. Uh, it's one that the, 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 the clinicians that are looking at this video and or clinicians in training need to be aware that wherever they work, if they speak Spanish and they're culturally competent, they're going to get a great job because this is a huge area of, of need. Just to put this in historical context, if you look at this slide for a moment on your computer, um, this became Mexico and then it became the United States recently. So let's bear in mind that all of this part of the United States was part of the Viceroyalty of New Spain, and this part of the United States on which I'm standing here in Texas uh, is only a recent addition to the United States. Essentially, in many respects, we are working in Latin America. The theoretical orientation of, of border social work is that many of the issues that surround the border are ones of injustice and our population here, being minority majority, is experiencing economic injustice, health disparities, immigration injustice, environmental just, injustice, housing injustice, and dominance by border elites. Uh, by being at the periphery, that means that we are um, primarily governed by people in Austin and uh, Washington, D.C., respectively, and people in Ciudad Juarez are primarily being governed by people in Mexico City. So that means we have little meaningful process in the larger and overarching issues of, of governance. That being said, as a background, uh, we need to focus in now on the clinical part of what we're going to do today in this module, and that is we're going to talk about what it is to be a culturally competent social worker and a social uh, a culturally competent health provider, because I think a lot of what we have to say over the course of this module has to do equally with nurse practitioners, with physicians, psychologists, counselors, and licensed drug counselors who will be working with this population, because the culturally grounded social worker understands all of the emerging trends in cultural competence, such as cultural adaptation, and it understands culture as the intersectionality of ethnicity, gender, religion, age, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, and immigration status. So it's really important to go back to that graph that you've seen in class called the axes of oppression, uh, the axes of discrimination, that recognize that ethnicity in and of itself is only one identification feature, one feature of identity that we need to be concerned with if we're going to be culturally competent. The tendency when we talk about cultural competence in social work and in clinical work is to say, how do I become a social, a social worker who's clinically competent or culturally competent with African American clients? How can I more effectively work uh, with gay and lesbian clients? Um, how may I work uh, with, with um, Hispanic clients? This is too simplistic. Um, what we need to recognize is that each person who walks into our room or each works person who is involved in our group session is has at an intersection of multiple sources of identity that, that define who they are and how they are experiencing the difficulty that, that, they have, that has brought them to the office or has brought them to, to care. Um, and it has a huge 
uh, hugely important is their socioeconomic status, their religion, the way they view and interpret the world. So the worker, uh, be it a social worker or a counselor, examines the impact of discrimination, oppression, and economic deprivation and disenfranchisement on the person because the remediation is not within the psyche as maybe a person who's trained in intrapsychic or depth psychology approaches might argue, but a classically social work. It's in the person in their environment, and their environment, including the community, the nation, the city, the region, and all of these features of their culture which inform their identity. So it's really important for us to sense that culturally grounded professional explores then that identity within the context of racism, sexism, heterosexualism, classism, ageism, ableism, and other forms of discrimination, because these factors are, in many cases, the sources of difficulty, and in some cases, the sources of trauma that bring them into care. Critical to a culturally grounded professional is the need for self-awareness about one's own culture. It's been said in this uh, interview in, in this module, or will be said in this inter module several times, that you do not have to be a, a Hispanic to be a good social worker with Hispanic clients, any more than you have to have been born in the 13th century to be a good medieval historian, uh, or that you have to be a person in recovery to be a good drug abuse counselor. Quite the contrary. All you have to do is to be well informed about all of these axes of oppression, well informed about the culture of the client and everything she brings into the therapeutic relationship, but also keenly self-aware of your own biases, your own attitudes and beliefs, and responses to people that are different from you. And that's really an important thing that all clinicians have to come to grips with early on in their training, and then to repeat that self-examination again and again. Where do I stand with respect to this group? and to this person? Are my biases um, intrusive in my way of thinking about them and in any way interfering with the development of a genuine therapeutic relationship? So this is the figure that I referred to for your study at a later time, but it demonstrates all of the interact intersecting axes of privilege, domination, and oppression that a person can bring into the therapeutic relationship. A linguistically grounded health professional, and social worker in particular, is somebody who's linguistically competent in at least two languages. Now, this is uh, a, a very unique feature of our department that may be uh, less uh, representative of other departments and schools of social work around the country, but bear, but bear in mind that it's an important part of being a good social worker with minority persons for whom English is a second language. There's a huge shortage of people in the United States who are clinicians, be it psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, or others, who are completely or nearly fluent in Spanish. This is very uh, keen healthcare shortage need in the United States. So we've spent a lot of time and energy at UTEP training people who are not just culturally competent, but also linguistically competent. And what that means is that you're highly proficient in the first language of the client, whether that language is Laotian, uh, whether it is Hmong uh, in the case of Indochina, or whether in the case of Latin America it's Portuguese, Spanish, or in, in the Caribbean also possibly French Creole, um, understands and uses the health and mental health terminology in both languages. So here in our college and in our school, we have a major, majority minority um, student body, most of our students uh, speak Spanish at least at a strong intermediate level. Some are native speakers. For some of them, it's their first language. For others, it, their, their level is fairly moderate, and English is their first language. But even the best trained students, that is, ones that speak Spanish well, that is to say at a high level of proficiency as it would be defined by a Spanish professor, have very little uh, grasp of health and mental health terminology, and in particular, uh, the terminology that goes along with uh, diagnosis assessment and coming up with all of the categories that we necessarily use to, to uh, identify people in the context of the disorder. So our classes uh, emphasize terminology, and uh, we also then also will correct people on the proper use of Spanish around terms like uh, feedback, uh, uh, following through, 
I'm making referrals. We demonstrate and teach all of those terms so that people know how to say that in an agency where everybody else is going to be using that language. Um, linguistically grounded professional is also a person who is keenly attuned to the body language of, uh, of the person and this recognizing that this is very different from one culture to another. Not to make any stereotypes, but it's clearly uh, most people would observe in, in working with Hispanic clients that their, their body movement is distinctly different in, in verbal expression and it tends to be more animated, the hand, use of hands. Uh, is, 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 is greater uh, than in the sort of dominant culture. But we also need to be uh, looking at more subtle cues and uh, we also, in, then in our, in, in our classes, in our training, by virtue of tra taping these interactions between students and standardized patients, are able to focus in, did you notice what this client was doing with respect to holding her hands against her chest indicating that she was protecting herself or other ways in which um, the body language could be expressing something that's going on uh, inside her that she's not verbalizing. Another element of the linguistically grounded professional is that they incorporate the core cultural values of the client into their communication, recognizing that each culture has powerful cultural core values that identify it and give meaning to the world for that particular client. For instance, I'll give you an example from uh, the Anglo-Saxon type client. Um, if you were to uh, a, a social worker here in El Paso and you got a call to go to a, um, a retirement community where uh, Mrs. Smith uh, needed to see a social worker and you had an appointment with that uh, Mrs. Smith at one o'clock in the afternoon in her apartment at, at this retirement home and uh, you showed up at 1.30, um, what do you think would be Mrs. Smith's response? Of course she would be offended, she would be annoyed, she would be irritated, she would, you'd start off the relationship on the a wrong foot and that's because of the very central importance of time to Anglo culture. Uh, similarly, we see uh, very powerful cultural values in Hispanic culture. Uh, these are terms that are developed by anthropologists, Hispanic and Mexican and Latino anthropologists, not terms invented by me, but respeto, respect, dignidad, dignity, community, community, fe or faith, formalidad, politeness, formality, orgullo, pride, fatalismo, fatalism, personalismo, personalism, and sympatia, or charm, or social engagement. So we teach all of our students about all of these cultural values and how to interpret them through uh, the therapeutic relationship and how to see um, that these are the sources of meaning that define uh, what the person is experiencing and how the lens through which they process these, these difficulties that they're going through. Um, so, making it happen. We try our best in our courses and in our group supervisions and in the placements that we do in the community to enhance their fluency in speaking, writing, and in verbal movement, uh, facial expression, cadence, formality, and sense of time and orientation. By the way, we use the term Latino and Hispanic interchangeably in this part of the country. Most people prefer Hispanic. In other parts of the country, others would prefer Latino. We're focused also on resilience, and this is a thing that I think you'll see in the interview segments that we have uh, in the module. Most uh, clinicians work, that are practicing today were trained in the deficits model rather than the strengths model, meaning that we go into the clinical relationship trying to figure out what's wrong. And a great deal of literature in, in, in social work and psychology of the last few decades has focused on this and saying, really turn that set of, take that set of glasses off and put on another set of glasses that tell you that here's a person full of strength, full of the capacity for recovery, full of all kinds of great ideas about what could be done right if the systems were properly activated and the barriers are removed. So we're committed deeply in the therapeutic relationship in a culturally competent way to focusing on their resilience, their assets, and a key term, cultural capital. 
Because when you are troubled, and when you've faced hardship, or when you've had a loss, um, the things that you derive meaning and strength from are, could be called your co cultural capital. It's a form of wealth that you have, uh, cap thus the term capital. So what do I draw on if, if I'm facing adversity? We'll see this in particular in the case that we simulate for you of Antonio, who's a veteran who looks back to his Hispanic roots as the cultural capital that sustained him uh, and through surviving the Vietnam War with distinction and then coming back to the United States and surviving two significant losses just in a few years and how he turned to his cultural capital as a way of interpreting and understanding those experiences and how the social worker could ask him to focus on those sources of cultural capital as a key part of his healing process. Now, the elements of the, of the project with Hogg are, are several fold. Uh, one is the, the, a class which every student who gets a Master of Social Work at the University of Texas at El Paso goes through called Social Work in the Border Region. Uh, that's because social work here is, is the same, yet different, as social work anywhere else. Um, but again, metaphorically, we can take this elsewhere, because if I were teaching this class in, in say, San Diego or San Francisco, it would be completely relevant because while the border might be close by in San Diego or very far away in the case of San Francisco, the, the context of the border issues is still the same. Uh, culturally grounded social work is another class that all of our students take. This is a class which trains them not just to deal with Hispanic clients but all of the other sources of diversity. These two classes are required. Then our cultural, our, our social work practice classes are all have the prefix multicultural because we believe that social work practice is always done uh, in a culturally competent way. Then every student who's on the Hogg Foundation grant, who's a grantee, um, a scholarship recipient or participant, is required to take a class in Spanish called Evaluation and Intervention in Spanish to do uh, the sort of skill development. And by the way, that class is taught entirely in Spanish. The only time English is used is if a person doesn't know a word in Spanish, they'll use the English word and then we'll provide them with the Spanish word. And then a border practical experience, meaning that their placement is done in an agency in which they see the kinds of issues that uh, you, you see uh, with culturally um, diverse people. And then the laboratory, which I'm standing in now, uh, which basically is a, uh, a room with a control station, the classes uh, behind this one-way mirror looking into an intervention, an assessment or clinical session that's being done in the other room and which has been recorded and this particular uh, laboratory which we designed uh, for the school uh, is such that they can play this back, we can critique it, we can show it and then in addition they can take away on a flash drive interviews that they've conducted in Spanish or in English and put them up on their, on their portfolio to demonstrate to their employers here, is, here I am doing an intervention with a woman uh, who's experiencing anarchy in Bolivia, or here I am uh, interacting with a, a Vietnam veteran, um, and so on. We use standardized patients in, in this context, meaning that the standardized patients are people that we have uh, trained, um, who um, we coach them on how to act out certain sorts of scenarios uh, to portray uh, uh, we use the term patient because standardized patient is a term that we've been using for a long, long time in our, in our field. But standardized clients, people who can portray um, the, the, uh, the case that we want to illustrate certain concepts around. Um, so, getting to the organization of the class. We teach this class, as I suggested, uh, in Spanish. Uh, all of the students are pre-screened ahead of time to determine their level of proficiency by the co-instructor, Dr. Chavez, and myself. We screen them to determine whether they're proficient enough to complete the class. We teach the class in Spanish, but we also do a coaching technique so that after the intervention is played back, and you'll see this in the units that we do where we simulate an interaction between a therapist and a patient, um, we do a coaching. And that means that we don't criticize them, say, that part that you did there, you really bombed. Instead, we try to say, um, here's something that you could think about when you do this the next time. 
And so it gives them a comfort zone and a safety zone that they need in a clinical setting because on the other side of that mirror there, there are 20 students watching them and there's a couple of uh, uh, other uh, PhDs in the room sort of critiquing them. It can be very nerve wracking. So you have the permission to fail. You have permission to make a mistake and you have permission to learn. And that's an important part of clinical teaching in any setting, but particularly one where you're trying out a new technique in a second language with a culture with, with, with which you're not familiar. Standardized patients, as I suggested, are paid, pre-screened. Uh, they're, they're taught uh, on how to enact certain roles. We have standardized patients uh, in the College of Health Sciences at UTEP and School of Nursing, ranging from college age all the way up to seniors uh, who can portray different sorts of scenarios. Uh, in our case, the uh, class that we teach, Evaluation and Intervention in Spanish, all of them are completely bilingual in Spanish and English. And uh, before each class, we can spend up to two hours uh, rehearsing and going through the case study that they're going to enact in a particular patient scenario. So they were given the case a few days uh, prior to the interaction um, with the students in, in class so that they can think about it. And then um, the other professor and I brief the standardized patient on what this sort of looks like. In addition, which we'll show videos of, uh, say we're talking about a person who has panic, panic attacks associated with an anxiety disorder, We'll show videos of somebody having a panic attack. Uh, it's, it's, unless you've seen a panic attack, it's very hard to describe. So the breathing, the fear, the, 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 the frightfulness of it, we'll show that to the, to, the, to the patient so that they can enact this and also show it to the students so they know what they're going to see when they get into the, into the field or out into, into an employment situation. Uh, because you need to be able to do behavioral rehearsal in your mind again and again is what am I going to do when I work with, with that particular case. We're using the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 case studies, a clinical guide to differential diagnosis as one of the sources that we look for for cases. But in many cases, what we'll do is we'll simply pull cases from our memory, from our practice in the community, here and elsewhere, and then re-write um, uh, those case scenarios so that, they, that, that we're pulling out of our own practice wisdom. Here are some examples of some of the scenarios that we have used. The Hispanic Iraq War veteran with post-traumatic stress disorder, clinical depression, and alcohol abuse. Um, many of the viewers live in a uh, community where there's a military base or there are a lot of veterans uh, from uh, recent con conflicts or from uh, more uh, not so recent conflicts like the Vietnam era conflict. But here in El Paso, we have uh, Fort Bliss uh, Army Reservation, which is a, an army base with 35,000 active duty personnel. Um, so we have uh, a lot of folks who will be going out and working with veterans. Uh, this is probably true for you um, in, in your environment because there have been millions of people who have been affected by the Iraq and Afghan or uh, wars over the last few years. A middle-aged middle -aged woman with chronic paranoid schizophrenia, while you probably won't see that too often in, in, in practice context, you still need to be prepared for that, especially if you work in an internal, uh, a, a, uh, uh, inpatient facility, uh, such as a psychiatric hospital. A college-age woman who lives with bulimia and anxiety, and we're gonna play one of those scenarios here in this module. A socially isolated young culinary arts student with drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, our, our emphasis is on then on exposing students to the more common uh, diagnostic categories and, and disorders so that they're coming out of the school social work with, with a pretty good sense of what it is skill-wise that they're going to be confronted with. Technology, as you, as I mentioned, there's a 20-seat observation room that we have with one-way glass, and the lab's equipped with two remote cameras, one in each side of the, of the room so that we can zoom in and zoom out on clients and uh, then record them. We can, we can pan over to see the, the therapist, pan over to see the, the uh, uh, client, and we can have two cameras from which we can go back and forth. Uh, it's a very expensive room. We built, designed it when the new building was being created. You don't need a, uh, a very expensive laboratory to use this technology. 
You can use just a standardized tripod camera with a monitor and still achieve the same effect for a whole lot less money. But if you have the opportunity for grant funds, this is a way that you might want to consider uh, going. Um, we then, as I suggested, have students transfer these sorts of things to CD-ROMs, to DVDs, and to flash drives for distribution. Um, we also have class assignments that a number of our faculty use the lab, and they have, students have to turn in an interview, um, and, and uh, whether by YouTube or another medium, that then the student and teacher can critique and learn from that. The tool of all of this is the students are immediately able to see themselves asking questions and probing using body language and other fundamental clinical skills. And every social worker who's been trained this way, and I was trained this way at the University of Kentucky some time back, um, were, were shocked at first by, gee, I didn't know that I spoke that way, talked that way, moved that way, fidgeted that way, um, what have you. And that instant feedback is a very powerful corrective to uh, distracting sorts of behaviors, but even in the more complex cases where you're, you're assessing dialogue and reflection and probing and restating things back to the client, this is a very powerful clinical teaching tool to be able to see yourself uh, instantly uh, being uh, uh, given feedback after that by, by your professor in a constructive and helpful way. So not only do uh, the professors in, in the department give feedback to the client, but this, the patients themselves, the standardized patients, will give feedback. We have a hospital down the hall, it's a, stand, it's a simulated hospital, um, much like the simulated social work lab, um, in which we also collaborate with nursing students, physical therapy students, occupational therapy students, and speech-language pathology students, and we have clients who are inpatient there, so we can do down the hall anything that we can do here, but the person is in a bed, and we have cameras overhead, and we're able to do inter uh, bedside interventions as well. Um, and after each of those interventions, the patient then, the standardized patient, uh, will recount their experience. Here's what I felt like when you talked to me. Um, maybe you didn't spend a good enough time, a good amount enough time establishing rapport with me. You cut right to the chase. Uh, it seemed like you were looking at your clipboard uh, to the exclusion of having, establishing any eye contact with me. Um, etc. Um, this provides then the student with a great deal of support and reinforcement uh, that, they, that they need. In teaching cultural competence, um, a little bit more nebulous thing to do, but we cover a number of cultural characteristics that are used by anthropologists to describe various forms of uh, culture, uh, and in our case, the emphasis is on Hispanic clients because that's our grant. Uh, and then we use a book called Mental Health Care for New Hispanic Immigrants. We'll have links to this, of course, associated with the module. And we'll also have a list of suggested additional readings for you that you can look at on how to teach culturally com cultural competence in your classes. We use New Hispanic Immigrants Innovative Approaches to Contemporary Clinical Practice for Gonzalez and Gonzalez Ramos. And this book stresses the heterogeneity of, his of Hispanics and Latinos in the United States and how understands how mental disorders are understood and interpreted by Hispanics because the, the way in which Anglo uh, schools of social work, uh, no, no criticism intended, um, tend to, to teach clinical social work is from the Western legacy point of view, from dominant cultural point of view, and we take an antithetical orientation to that. We think that that's patronizing and we, we really want to meet the client where that client is culturally uh, because they understand mental disorder very, very differently from the dominant paradigm, and we teach people how to do that. Uh, in each case, um, the standardized patient is given a few days before the class, as I said, and uh, then they're able to, to uh, prepare for that. What I'd like to do in, in this next segment is to introduce you to some of the values and core values that inform clinical practice with Latino clients. And these are core values that have been demonstrated again and again by anthropologists, clinicians, physicians, and social workers to influence the expression of both physical disorder and mental disorder in Hispanics and also uh, frame to a great degree 
the manner in which people can capture uh, their cultural capital and act on their cultural capital toward recovery. The, the terms will go through one by one. Familismo, uh, the concept of the family as being the preeminent social institution in Latino life, is a deep commitment to and loyalty to the family as the key social institution and a belief that the family is one source of strength, meaning, pride, and that it is also a place of refuge. Clinically, we will see this again and again and again, that the world is understood and framed through loyalty to family, obligation of family, and the sense that one is, when is, one is failing, that it brings, it reflects poorly on the family. So while the family is very forgiving, and is a source of refuge, people often do their best to behave well because of the, the, the concern for the reputation of their family. But family, as a, as a result, source of resilience, is quite obvious that, that when it, one is in, in, in during hardship, one can turn quickly to one's family, and we see this in our clients and we try to teach it to our students. But aspetto, um, literally translated as respect, but it's a little broader than that, and, in Spanish. The importance of valuing people regardless of their social status. Deference to elders. That's implicit in Latino culture. Deference to elders. Elders are held in very high regard. Commitment to upholding people rather than denigrating them. To denigrate people is to fail to show respect, and failing to show respect is uh, not seen kindly in a Hispanic culture, and a belief in the inherent worth and, and, and dignity of all people. That, of course, is one of the key social, va social work values as uh, iterated by Felix Biesteck and the principles of casework. You've heard that term before, so, but this is a cultural value in, in, in Hispanic culture that's very, very important. Uh, fatalismo, this is often confused with sort of fatalism, and what will happen will happen, uh, que sera, sera. That's not what I'm talking about with fatalismo. Fatalismo is a little more profound than that. Uh, fatalismo is the notion that things happen beyond one cons one's control, that for sure, but they often happen for a reason. It's us, for us to fathom out what that reason might be, but if something happens that's outside of my control, it's not my fault. And in therein is a source of healing when working with people for, to whom something very ter terrible has happened. My own work is very much involved with refugees from trauma and terror and crime and torture and abduction in, in Mexico. And I find that fatalismo is one of the ways in which they interpret that experience. Is that I, I wasn't responsible for it, but in some sense I think maybe it happened for a reason and that that I, not being at fault for it, I'm not to blame for it, and I can recover from it because it wasn't me that needs to feel guilty about it. Fatalismo is also a sense that people have a destiny. Um, this is a, a common feature uh, throughout the Latin American region, all the way down to Argentina and Chile, that, that there is a destiny, or destino, todos tenemos destinos, and that's not mean, it does not mean that it's predefined, that, that, that something's going to happen because my whole life is pre-programmed by some divine source. That's not it at all. But my life has destiny in the sense that it's part of purpose, there's a pattern and a t trajectory to my life that I'm fulfilling my destiny by living this life. That also, der people derive a great deal of meaning from that. And that not everything that I can do is subject to my influence. Not everything that happens can I do anything about. Um, some things that happen I can't do anything about, so that means I have to not necessarily accept them, but recognize that I can't overcome them in some cases. Personalismo, uh, we know very much uh, that any of us uh, who are not Latino, as I'm not, although I did grow up in South America, um, know that personalismo is, is very much a Latino characteristic. It's not to say other cultural groups don't have these characteristics, but they, 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 they rise above the norm 
in, in Hispanics. And that's the value of people is partly rooted in their interpersonal relationships. And the value that people place on interpersonal relationships is huge. You don't want to bring dishonor to your friend. You don't want to bring dishonor to your family. Um, and they, these relationships, um, we, we, we maintain them, if we believe in this principle and hold it there, we maintain these relationships with loyalty, also with charm. Uh, we are charming and accepting toward those whom we care for. We bring humor to the situation and we have trust and consideration in our relationships. You'll, you, you'll notice, again, these are not stereotypes, these are cultural attributes, that the value on people is so central to um, the Hispanic culture. And again, tying this back, this becomes a source of strength in the therapeutic relationship because one can quickly embed people or re-embed people back into their personal network because all of us have a personal network and a family network. Fe, which is faith, is a belief in the centrality of faith in the life of people in the community. Um, not purely understood as in terms of religiosity. Um, that's one element of faith, but there are people who are not religious who still have faith. And faith is um, a, a belief that there is some recognition of God and divinity as manifest in the world as an active presence. Um, that, Again, not necessarily purely in a theological sense, but in the sense that there is something greater than me that has an influence on me in the world, and that I have to recognize that and come to terms with that, because I'm small by comparison to that. And it becomes a source of meaning in interpreting life and suffering and mystery. And faith is something that people turn to to help them deal with suffering and understand mystery. And we find in, in, in sessions with, with, especially with refugees, that they say that faith has been the thing that sustained them the most on their journey uh, to the North. Dignidad or dignity is the sense of self-worth that informs one's purpose. Um, the value of self-worth is integral to, I think, all human beings, that self-efficacy and self-worth are elements of the self-actualized individual using Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Self-worth is something that is held in high regard in Hispanic culture, and dignity is the need to maintain that. One doesn't want to insult or lose one's dignity. So the importance of maintaining proper relationships and comporting oneself in a manner that's uplifting and not degrading. That's a very important element of the concept of dignity. And an ability to maintain composure in the face of indignity. That is, when one is treated with indignity, responding with dignity would be the culturally acceptable, uh, culturally appropriate manner in working with, uh, that, that a Hispanic would bring to that relationship. You don't have to lower yourself to the level of your enemy or your oppressor to respond to your enemy or oppressor. Oppressor. Humildad or humility is the belief in the value of self-deprecation over pride. Um, something we Anglos could learn a little bit about once in a while. The notion of self-deprecation over pride and boastfulness. It is unseemly in, in Latin America. I lived in Latin America for 25 years. I went to grade school there. I went to high school there. I taught two universities there. The one thing that you can definitely do wrong in in Latin America is to be a braggart or to be boastful. It's very unseemly. So humility is uh, embodied by someone who will put self behind service to others, service to others over self every time. And that's the embodiment of humility. A much disputed and misunderstood term in Hispanic culture is that of machismo. And so I'm going to spend a few more minutes on this one. Machismo uh, has been conflated with aggressive, bully-type uh, behavior, sexist behavior by Latino men. That is the stereotype of, of machismo. Um, that, I don't think, is a very good uh, understanding over, over the long term, because the role of machismo in its more positive light, which is what I'm going to present, is that there's a belief in most Latino cultures, 
that men have a duty and an obligation, an inherent duty and an obligation, to protect, support, nurture, and defend their families. Again, this isn't saying that other cultures don't have that, but this is a pronounced element in Latino culture. The role of a man to his family, to the women in his life, to the, is, a, is a dutiful one. He has this duty that he cannot escape. And, and many of the things that we see in clinical work with, with Hispanic men often resolve, revolve around their failure to have done this and their guilt about having failed to do this. It's also a conviction, secondarily, a conviction that women and men have different roles and responsibilities. We certainly see that uh, manifested throughout the world, in, in many cases to a degree which is sexist overtly. But here it's framed in difference, not necessar necessarily as being superior, inferior, uh, subordinate, and superordinate, but rather different. And I think that's the thing that often gets lost in the discussion of the role of men in Latino culture, is that they have to be dominant, not necessarily. They have to have their, what I would call, proper role, rather than just the sole role of leader. That's why I put the term caballerismo here. Uh, a caballero is a gentleman. And the embodiment of the perfect man, when I was growing up, going to school in Paraguay and Colombia, was of a gentleman. A gentleman was a man who carried himself with distinction, style, good manners, dignity, respect. And that's the macho man, not the bully who puts people down. A sense that men must comport themselves as gentlemen or risk damaging their reputation and the reputation of their families. So to behave in an unseemly way, to engage in sexist behavior, no, that's not, that's not acceptable to a caballero or to a gentleman. Sympatia is the recognition of the importance of hospitality and charm, thoughtfulness, kindness, and humor in social relationships. One simple example would be the expression, when people come into your house, mi casa su casa, my home is your home. Um, that's just one little sort of uh, dicho that you could say re reflects sympatia, the sort of openness, hospitality, this willingness to serve, but also to charm, to be thoughtful, to be kind, and to be humorous. And sociability is a very dominant feature uh, in organizing hierarchies and relationships in, in Latino culture because it's linked to warmth, patience, and generosity, and openness. And the ideal person is simpatico, as the expression would say. Simpatia uh, does not translate as sympathy. That is not a direct trans uh, uh, translation. There are a lot of words in Spanish that don't translate literally. Sympathy in English means feeling sorry for someone. Sympathy and sympathy in Spanish has no relationship with feeling sorry for someone. Now, another concept which would say be the opposite side of the coin of uh, machismo is marianismo. Marianismo is the conviction that women hold a special place are in many ways superior to men. I bet you haven't heard that uh, if you're not Latino about Latino society. Many stereotypes about Latino society are that women hold a subordinate place. Certainly that's true in some homes. Certainly that's true in some people's beliefs. But underneath, and going all the way back to, to, to the woman for whom this is named, which is Mary, um, is the sense that in many ways women are superior. And the sense that women must achieve a higher standard of decorum than men. It's okay for the boys to to act out or to play rough or what have you, but the girls have to achieve a higher standard of decorum. We're going to illustrate that case in a woman with anorexia and bulimia who comes from the upper class of El Paso society. Again, a standardized penetration scenario that's not based on a real case, but on an amalgamation of case, in which that standard of higher standard of decorum for her ended up leading to anorexia and bulimia. There's also a belief in Marianismo that women may also have to suffer, not unlike Mary who lost his, her son, but that suffering brings dignity and brings meaning. Also, suffering is an issue that I explored a great deal in talking with refugees, and, and suffering was always not always seen as a, as a horrible or awful thing, because suffering was interpreted through uh, the lens that this made me stronger, this made me a better person because I experienced it with dignity. 
a, a wonderful book that illustrates this is Man's Search for Meaning by Bruno Bettelheim, if you want to explore that a little further in your own reading. Uh, also, Marianismo is the belief that women are more pure and less easily tempted or corrupted, so therefore they have to hold themselves in, in check, if you will. And finally, a sense that women have to make sacrifices for their families. Now, in some cases, uh, we see perversions of these, uh, of, of these principles where they're played out in unhealthy ways, but machismo can be played out in a very health, unhealthy way, and marianismo can be played out in an unhealthy way. And when we see that in the therapeutic relationship, we try to reframe it as a, as a strength, as an asset, rather than a, as a deficit. Because a lot of people use cultural attributes of, 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 of other ethnic groups as stereotypes in order to belittle them, in order to make them seem inferior. Here, what I've tried to do, and what we try to do on our project with the Hogg Foundation, is show that cultural attributes are not things that you stereotype people with, but things that you uplift people with and attempt to point to as sources of cultural capital. An article about this particular uh, presentation and uh, this module can be found in a course in a paper that we wrote in the Journal of Teaching and Social Work, Teaching Clinical Social Work in Spanish, Cultural Competency, and Mental Health by Dr. Chavez, uh, Mr. Palomo, uh, Ms. Palacios, and me. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>